Handheld gaming has always been a deep passion of mine. Think back to those big bulky arcade machines and how revolutionary it must have been to be able to play those same games at home on a console. That same feeling sparks up when you can take that console game and play it on the go. Advancements in technology have allowed us to make gaming devices much smaller than they used to be, to the point where we can now play big, massive open world games all on the go. In a time where handheld gaming needed a library of games tailored to the pick up and play experience, we ended up with some of the most iconic Legend of Zelda games to date. One of those, of course, being Minish Cap. Minish Cap? Mi Minish? Mi Minish? It, it seems like it's supposed to be a play on the word mini, so Minish Cap feels more appropriate here. A portable Zelda adventure so tiny it could fit in a baby's hand. Well, the cartridge could at least. They took the portable gimmick of handheld gaming and developed a gameplay gimmick for shrinking down in this game to suit the theme. It's cute, clever, and one of the most memorable Zelda experiences to date. I remember loving this game as a kid, though I'm going to be honest with you, I remember these things looking a lot bigger back then. In all seriousness, this is the Funky S, the world's smallest foldable handheld gaming device. And this thing is so incredibly tiny it had to be specially assembled in the factory by Smurfs afflicted with dwarfism. And just look at the size of this thing compared to the original cartridge for Minish Cap. So I figured there was no better device to experience this game on. After all, what was more fitting than playing the smallest Zelda on the smallest, foldable, gaming handheld? That being said, holding this thing makes me feel like a giant. My thumbs cover practically all the buttons on the front, and gaming on the Funky S for more than, say, 15 minutes at a time isn't exactly the most comfortable experience. And thus, the challenge was born. The smallest Zelda on the smallest foldable handheld. I also gave myself a time limit to adhere to, and I'll talk more about that in the challenge section of the review, so for now, let's just get started. Okay, I lied. Don't start yet. I realized when putting the video together that using this footage for the whole thing wasn't going to cut it. So I went and recorded some nicer looking footage to splice in here and there, and I hope you enjoy that. Now we can start. Minish Cap isn't your typical Zelda story. Well, it kind of is, but there isn't a Master Sword or Ganondorf to be seen. It actually takes place pretty early on as far as the official Zelda timeline goes. We play as a little blonde boy wearing a green tunic that only knows how to scream and grunt. I named him Tink, because he's so tiny. Well, I tried to at least, and I fumbled the controls a bit while doing that. Tin? Oh, damn it. Anyways, Tink lives with his grandpa, and helps as an apprentice blacksmith. He also happens to be close friends with Princess Zelda, who invites Tink to join her at the Picori Festival. The Picori being this tiny elvish race that once got along with humans, but now mostly seem to keep to themselves. While at the festival, Zelda even gifts Link, uh, Tink a teensy tiny shield so he can use it to protect her. It's a sweet gesture, and it works about as well as, say, trying to cut an apple with a chair. The evil sorcerer Vati shows up and ruins the festival by lecturing everyone on the lore of an onion man. What? Wrong Vati? Well, either way, he mainly just shows up, breaks the legendary sword into pieces, it sets a bunch of monsters free, petrifies the princess, and then vanishes. When Tink awakes, he finds out that the broken sword might have been able to lift the curse upon Zelda if it weren't for the fact that it's been reduced to scrap. The people that forged the blade were the Picori, and they're the only ones that can reforge it. The catch is that they only seem to reveal themselves to children, so the king sends Tink off on a perilous journey to save the kingdom despite being like 12 years old and having little to no formal training. Eventually, Tink encounters Ezlo, Vati's former master, who has also been cursed by being turned into a weird bird hat looking thing. He just so happens to color match with Tink's outfit perfectly, so the two agree to journey together in order to reforge the Picori sword and defeat Vati. There aren't really any major twists in the plot. Though the game does share some big connections with the Four Swords games, namely with the origins of Vati and the Four Sword itself. The plot pretty much stands on its own, however, and you won't need to play any other Zelda game to enjoy the story of Minish Cap.
Minish Cap is much like the other 2D Zelda adventures out there. You explore dungeons, solve puzzles, and collect new items to help you solve more puzzles. You have two equip slots, and you can change the items assigned to these slots through the pause menu. Sure, it's not the most intuitive way to change equipment, but it does work. Zelda games usually have some form of gimmick, the ability to traverse between two worlds, for example, and Minish Cap is no different. Here, the game's main gimmick is that with the help of Ezlo, you are able to shrink down in size in order to explore new areas or interact with different things. Take animals, for example. When you're mini, you can actually talk to them. Some may even try to attack you or peck at you, but the ability to shrink gives the player a new way to interact with the world around them. Another new feature added to the game are kin stones. These stones can be obtained in many different ways, and the player is able to fuse kin stones with certain NPCs in order to unlock an assortment of rewards. These rewards can be as pointless as spawning a chest full of rupees somewhere, or as valuable as heart pieces and equipment upgrades. The whole kin stones thing is pretty neat, but if you're a completionist, you'll find yourself backtracking constantly to locate the NPCs to fuse with, or the rewards. Some rewards just aren't worth it though, such as the mirror shield, which can only be obtained after beating the game, at which point there isn't really anything else to do with it. On the topic of shields, I kind of wish it had its own dedicated button, or was automatically equipped like the way Link has it on in A Link to the Past. With only two equip slots, you generally always want a sword equipped at all times. The other item is going to fluctuate between whatever you need to solve puzzles with. The R button has some useful functions, but the L button is dedicated to... Eh, take a wild guess. It's kinstones. So the L button is pretty useless unless you're standing directly in front of someone to fuse kinstones with. Did this feature really need its own dedicated button? Of course not. It's switching between your items in this game is kind of tedious, but that's really just par for the course as far as some 2D Zeldas go. The Game Boy Advance only had so many buttons to work with, and they did the best they could to make it work. You then of course have the rest of the game to take into account. Dungeons, puzzles, world exploration, combat, etc. There's less dungeons in the game than I thought there was. You've got about six main dungeons to conquer, and that's not too many. Some of the early game dungeons can be beaten very quickly as well. That doesn't mean this game is incredibly short. I mean, it's kind of small, I guess. But simply traveling from dungeon to dungeon can be quite the ordeal in and of itself. When recording this footage here, I had just played through the game on the Funky S, so I knew where to go and what to do. I averaged 13 minutes to beat the first and second dungeons each, whereas simply getting from the first to the second dungeon took closer to like 20 minutes. The segments in between the dungeons take much longer than you'd expect, requiring you to explore, solve puzzles, and obtain new items, much like the dungeons themselves. Some of these segments feel somewhat tedious, though. Like the part where you have to track down overdue library books to climb up a bookshelf, just so some old fart can drop you into his rancor pit, all so you can learn how to swim. At least, if you get lost in a dungeon, you have a detailed map that can tell you the rooms you have yet to explore, or about any chests you haven't opened. Getting lost on one of these in-between dungeon segments in the overworld is horrible because you might not have any clue where you should go or who you should talk to. These were the parts I remember getting stuck on the most as a kid, though the puzzles within the dungeons themselves are clever and fun. The first thing you do in dungeon number one is push a statue out of the way. Then you pull on these mushrooms to fling yourself over some gaps. Pushing and pulling objects it then becomes a theme throughout this dungeon, and the game just wanted to make sure that you understood this mechanic before you proceed any further. It's smart game design. On the reverse side of things, exploring the overworld feels tedious and boring. And so many paths are blocked off by a pit and a boulder. The idea being that once you reach the other side, you can push the boulder into the pit and unlock a shortcut. But take previous 2D Zeldas, like A Link to the Past, which is a gold standard for 2D Zelda games in my eyes. That game left things very open to the player. You could even tackle certain dungeons in whichever order you wanted to. Exploring the overworld felt rewarding and exciting. But in Minish Cap, you might find something that looks kind of interesting, but you can't quite figure out what to do with it. More often than not, the answer just ends up being something to do with the stupid kinstones. You had to fuse kinstones with someone, and a part of the open world might become available to you. Some crack opens up in the ground, or some water raises, I, I don't know. Now don't get me wrong, 
I do enjoy the idea of kinstones, but it does feel like they're overused somewhat. More often than not, it just feels like they're gating off fun places to explore. There's hardly a point to exploring the overworld if there's just going to be tons of places you can't reach unless you fuse kinstones with people. It really takes the whole adventure feeling out of things, you know? And you always end up having to backtrack to get these rewards anyways. Combat is fine though. Nothing too revolutionary here. Some enemies are weak to certain items, so you may need to shoot an arrow at an eye or suck something up using the gust jar. Most items feel like they play well with both combat and exploration, though certain items definitely feel more useful for the latter. I do have to say that combat was easier than I remember. Most enemies don't seem to deal much damage to you. Even playing on the tiny funky S, I hardly struggled with any fights. This may be one of the easier 2D Zeldas in terms of combat, though that doesn't mean everyone will share the same experience. I'm just stating that compared to other 2D Zelda games that I've played, combat in Minish Cap feels easier than most. Boss fights are fun and engaging, though honestly, I'm kind of disappointed at the lack of fights that require you to change size mid-battle. There's like two of these throughout the whole game, and I really like the concept of it. Battle something at regular size to weaken it, then you shrink down and destroy it from the inside. It's just such a cool idea that I really wish the game did more with it. Although there are some boss fights that are just plain annoying too, such as this Octorok that freezes the ground below you, making everything slippery. In summary, while I enjoyed the dungeons and puzzles, I found it very easy to get lost in between dungeons. I enjoy the concept of kinstones, but feel like they're overused somewhat and take away from the enjoyment of exploration, oftentimes forcing you to backtrack. And combat is a little on the easier side, but I do really enjoy some of the clever boss fights in the game. Minish Cap takes on the toon style of graphics as seen with games like Wind Waker. I think this toon style looks amazing on the Game Boy Advance. All of these sprites are vibrant and colorful. Everything just seems to really pop. Even Link, I mean Tink, has many animations that are just a joy to look at and are absolutely filled with character. The ability to shrink down allows you to explore an entire new world. Climbing a bookshelf becomes a massive undertaking, and enemies that you would normally be capable of defeating in one or two hits are now boss creatures, as seen with the game's first boss. Traversing between big and small worlds is a real treat sometimes. When you're just running around in small form, you stand only a few pixels high, but you have this handy dandy speech bubble to help point out where you are. This is a really good thing, since I'd never be able to see Tank when playing on the Funky S without it. He just becomes so ridiculously tiny, he looks like a single pixel. I really like how they make these two worlds feel so vastly different. A minor inconvenience like rain is a deadly hazard when tiny. A crack in the ground is an entire new world to explore, a puddle becomes an ocean, you get the idea. All of this really helps to convey a more adventurous theme and the accompanying soundtrack plays beautifully with this adventurous vibe. Many of the songs are from previous Zelda games, remade in the GBA sound font, but there are plenty of original tracks here too. Things really hit home for me the first time you enter the Minish Woods. You can see the rays of sunlight peeking out from the side of the screen, with the rays slowly disappearing the deeper into the forest you go. As you travel further, a mist starts to overtake the screen. All of this conveys the idea that you're now losing yourself in a dense maze of leaves, with whatever sunlight that could reach you being lost in the lush greenery. The music is light and blissful. It feels appropriate for the beginning of an adventure, but also has these, uh, what I'd call dips, I guess, which complement the feeling of bewilderment and curiosity as you lose yourself deeper in this forest. I feel like the game utilizes such a unique art style that it will never age. The music is also timeless. For the most part, this would be your typical Minish Cap playthrough. The only catch being the device I'm playing the game on. The Funky S. This thing is ludicrously tiny. I figured the only major challenge would be battling with the ergonomics of this thing, which can easily be avoided by playing the game in short bursts here and there. So I decided to give myself a time limit of 3 days to finish the game. The Funky S has a 410mAh battery, giving it approximately 1-2 to two hours of playtime depending on what game you're emulating and the system's brightness. A casual playthrough of the game clocks in at approximately 15 hours, so divide that into 3 days and that's 5 hours of gaming a day on this thing. On a device this size, that seemed like the perfect amount. 
though I would have to charge the Funky S a few times while playing. My thumbs were big enough to cover the entirety of the D-pad and four face buttons. Yet despite that, I found it surprisingly easy to push only the button I wanted to. Movement was a tad finicky at times, with me accidentally pushing in multiple directions, though that never happened frequently enough to make getting from point A to point B a chore. Pushing L or R was a slightly different story, because those buttons on the Funky S are kind of stiff, so you also need to hook a finger underneath the device to push one of those buttons. You use the R button pretty frequently in the game since you need it to roll or pull objects or pick up things, so I had to get used to this position in order to effectively use that button. I gotta say, when I started recording this footage here, I was playing the game on a much more comfortable controller. The performance between the two is night and day. I don't even think I took damage in the first two boss fights with a proper controller. The speaker on the Funky S is in an awkward position as well, and even though that doesn't really seem to impact gameplay, I just had to mention it. There's speaker cutouts on both the bottom left and right corners, but as we can see through the transparent plastic, there's only one speaker located at the bottom left. If you got a fat thumb like I do, it'll cover the whole thing during gameplay. The screen is also incredibly tiny, but more importantly, it's not the same ratio as the Game Boy Advance. You can change the aspect ratio to what it should be, but it makes big black bars take up the top and bottom of our screen. And in the end, we have to settle with a stretched aspect ratio, which makes things a little thin. But I think it's better than dealing with black bars taking up real estate on this already tiny screen. By far the most annoying part was battery life. Honestly, it's not that big of a deal, really. I was getting almost two hours from a full charge, and that's plenty for a device like this. But playing on the Funky S while it's charging is a complete nightmare, since the charger sticks out of the right side and it's not comfortable at all to hold. It's an easy fix, just don't play while charging, right? But I had a pretty busy few days and had everything planned to match my free time, so I needed to get the extra hours of playtime in. I thought since I played through the game once as a kid, I'd be able to breeze through some things here and there, but apparently I remembered much less about the game than I thought, and even found myself lost more than a couple times. One of the strongest benefits to the Flunky S is how seamless the suspend feature works. Close the device and it creates an automatic save state that instantly loads up once you open the device again. It makes taking quick breaks super easy. And another benefit to this is that it will do the same thing when the device runs out of battery. Which did happen to me. The battery died, but when I plugged it back in and turned it on, I was able to continue my game from exactly where I left off. It's a super nice quality of life feature that made regular in-game saves feel kind of obsolete. Which is exactly what led to my downfall. While in the final dungeon, shortly after I recorded this footage here actually, the game suffered a hard crash. I was forced to restart my system, and unfortunately, this corrupted the autosave, and it wouldn't even load the game now. This all meant I had to load my last manual save, which was hours ago. I'm talking I had lost dungeons worth of progress. All I could do at that point was put the game down, and I didn't even touch it the next day. I just couldn't bring myself to. Have you ever lost hours of progress in a game that you were playing? You just feel so gutted after. Especially when you're so close to the end of the goal. I mean, I I, I was right... Th you can't see my fingers right now, but they're just they're, they're tinier than Tiny Link. I mean, Tink. I, whatever, who cares at this point? I was really close to the end. Anyways, I beat the game on day 5. The main purpose behind the time limit was so that I would have to battle with the ergonomics of the Funky S. But I'm going to be honest with you, I did actually kind of get used to them. They're not perfect or ideal but they work surprisingly well. I only suffered misinputs with the D-pad, and they weren't bad enough to cause major frustration. In the end, playing through an entire Zelda game on the Funky S almost seemed like a perfect fit. It may have been a failed challenge, but by the end the main purpose of it felt kind of pointless anyways. Like I said, I started to feel much more comfortable with the ergonomics of the Funky S. And it isn't too difficult to see what's happening on screen, unless Link shrinks down, in which case you might have to squint a little bit to see him. Maybe I should have worn some bulky mittens or something for the challenge instead of a time limit, but Minish Cap is one of the easier 2D Zeldas out there. And I only died once in my playthrough, actually. This was mostly because I was in an incredibly awkward position trying to capture footage and playing the game through my camera's viewfinder. A final playtime was shorter than the projected 15 hours, if you're not counting the time wasted in the crash, in which case 
I don't think it took much longer than the 15 hours, really. It's a pretty short and easy adventure. And as punishment for failing the challenge, I will attempt to speedrun Mario 64 on the Funky S. But that's another video, and I have a different Mario 64 video planned to release first, so stick around for that one. For now, let's take a look at the leaderboard, shall we? Minish Cap is a tiny game with a big heart, and I think it's very deserving of a third place rating. Meaning, it's better than good, it's great. The game is only held back by the overworld exploration elements. Simply trying to find secrets in the overworld isn't very fun when many of them are gated behind kinstone fusions, which will inherently require more backtracking than I may prefer. Getting lost on the way to your next dungeon is also a major pain since there's a distinct lack of communication to the player in where they should go next, or more specifically, how to get there. I remember having to travel through some areas that felt very out of the way to reach Syrup the Witch's Hut, for example. The combat was surprisingly easier than I remember though, and definitely easier than some of the other 2D Zelda games out there. But there's still some rather fun and engaging boss fights that require quick thinking and good reflexes to succeed. Puzzles are interesting and I like how well they implemented shrinking down to interact with the world differently. The visuals and music feel timeless to me, and I know I'll enjoy them even decades in the future. It's not my favorite 2D Zelda game, and some elements do feel a little too derivative of other Zelda titles, but Minish Cap is a great game that I highly recommend checking out if you have the time. Honestly, Nintendo can't release Game Boy Advance games for Nintendo Switch Online members soon enough. It was fun revisiting an old classic in a tiny year size. Though I gotta make it perfectly clear, I wasn't really sponsored or anything to talk about the Funky S and showcase it so heavily during the video. I just really liked the idea of it and wanted to get more use out of it. It's a device I would honestly recommend a lot more people pick up if it weren't for the sole gimmick that this device sells itself on, which is this microscopic size. It's very difficult to play a lot of games on this device. Although it surprisingly is best suited to games like Zelda and Pokemon. I wouldn't try playing much else on it though. Which is unfortunate because given its size, it's very powerful. In any case, I'll have a lot more videos coming out soon, so if you want to check those out, make sure to stick around. And in the meantime, if you enjoy this video, thanks. You know it means a lot. I appreciate you and everything you do. Ciao.